Oh, as we commence our conversation, a couple of reminders uh, for those of you who are very new to Microsoft uh, Teams. If you have any questions for our panelists, uh, please submit the question by clicking on the Q&A tab uh, that's located at the right hand side of your screen. Look for the uh, question mark uh, icon and click on it to display the Q&A panel and that will come up. Type your questions onto the dialog box and your questions will be attended to by our panelists. Uh, in the midst or uh, just about uh, towards the end of our program. So that all said, let's begin once again. In the light of the rising numbers of infection due to the COVID-19 pandemic, our nation is under a full movement control order or MCO or complete lockdown, MCO 3.0 it seems, or is it 3.1? I don't know. As a result, it has become even more prevalent for businesses to digitalize their operations, especially when more and more of their employees are working from home and almost everyone, you and me included, are turning into online shopping. However, digitalizing one's business goes beyond just having virtual team meetings or setting up a website to sell your products. Businesses still need to interact with other businesses before the final goods or services reach the end consumer. So ladies and gentlemen who are joining us, where do we even begin? Our conversation this morning addresses the future for business to business or B2B e-commerce and how to adapt to new business norms with our following speakers. So allow me to very quickly introduce them to you. Julian Neo began at DHL managing a portfolio of key financial institutions in year 2000 and has since held various sales management roles in Malaysia and a stint in Singapore, where he played an instrumental role in piloting and implementing DHL's successful global sales process and Asia Pacific sales program. Today, as Managing Director of DHL Express Malaysia and Brunei. He oversees the strategic leadership of all commercial activities of the business and delivers sustainable growth by focusing on revenue gain, market share and profit. Huge portfolio, Julian. Welcome. Thanks, Adrian. Up next is Mr. Yong Kai Ping, the CEO of Selangor Information Technology and Digital Economy Cooperation, or SIDAC. In his role, Kai Ping is tasked to nurture digital talents and narrow the digital divide in Selangor by empowering Selangor businesses and the digitalization of SMEs. He leads SIDAC in promoting digital investments and inspires emerging technologies to thrive in Selangor by aiming to accelerate Selangor startups to become regional tech icons. Kai Ping, good morning and welcome. And finally, Lance Xiang, the Managing Director of VLAN Asia, who founded this company in year 2003 with the intention of assisting businesses digitalize their operations and kickstart their digitalization process. An experienced serial entrepreneur. That's right. He leads a team of experts in the area of cloud solutions and customer experience, pioneering and leading Microsoft Cloud Service Provider in the SME space in Malaysia and remains the first and only partner of Zendesk, a complete cloud-based service desk solution here in Malaysia. Lance, good morning and hello. Morning, folks. Gentlemen, uh, Julian, if you don't mind, allow me to begin with you. DHL recently released a white paper predicting that online B2B will increase by more than 70% in year uh, 2027. That's what, six years, six years ahead. Uh, this, this prediction drive DHL to come up with this B2B e-commerce, uh, what, what, what is it? It's an ultimate guide, isn't it? Ultimate guide. All right. So no, thanks, Adrian. Thanks for the warm introduction and um, good morning uh, to everyone. Welcome to this webinar. No, you're absolutely right, Adrian. The, that was definitely a major drive for the launch of this ultimate guide, right? So first and foremost, I'd like to share not everybody knows what B2B e-commerce is all about. So a definition, a definition from my side would be a business buying from another business where the full interaction, including payments and shipping, is facilitated online via a transactional website without the need to become a customer first, lock in into a gated portal or speak to a salesperson, which is the traditional part of how we do or buy uh, things today. So from my end, I think my thoughts are the B2B world is definitely, definitely undergoing a period of intense transformation. We are on this side of the logistics under essential services are, are, are experiencing that change. We're seeing so much changes in supply chain, buying behaviors, customer experience as well. So traditional methods of B2B operations from sales to customer interactions, 
from fulfillment to order delivery are changing rapidly. And while the B2B world is already moving online, the pandemic, which is COVID-19, accelerated the whole process, meaning B2B transactions are even becoming more data-driven and less dependent on traditional one-to-one -one sales activity. So in 2019 alone, global sales on B2B e-commerce sites and marketplaces jumped at 18.2% to reach a huge amount of US dollar 12.2 trillion. And that is even outpacing the B2C sector. We constantly look at all B2C, it's growing so fast and all that, right? But B2B e-commerce is growing at even a faster rate. And to what you have mentioned, Adrian, this, this amount will reach 20.9 trillion US dollar by 2027. So Forrester alone predicts the US B2B e-commerce market, right, will, alone will reach 1.8 trillion dollars US dollar. And this will account for close to 17% of the B2B sales in the US. And this was, now these numbers was predicted pre-COVID, yeah, pre-pandemic. So, you know, Julian, uh, uh, you, we, are, we are moving from figures of uh, increase from million to billion, and now I just hear you say trillion. So, you know, with that said, you know, uh, Lance, going into the next uh, three to six months, right, how would you explain the adoption or evolution of the current B2B e-commerce scene uh, right here in Malaysia? Because, uh, you know, that Malaysia is really your forte. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for hosting us. Uh, so in the past, right, maybe three to six months actually seemed like a lifetime. Uh, <laughs> but we've actually seen company digitalization efforts uh, really that normally takes three years rammed into three months just to survive. So I feel although a lot of companies have already started some form of transformation, right, uh, it's not nearly enough. So it's going to be a very interesting six months to see how companies evolve further. Um, last year, we saw a lot of companies go online, right? Go online selling, go social media, go digital marketing on a large scale. Even ourselves, I mean, for us, <clears throat> we've been traditionally very face to face. Uh, but until up to last year's MCO, right? Uh, we struggled at first, uh, just like everyone else, uh, but I think we're getting better at it. Uh. So our mantra in Villain Asia is like, we eat our own dog food, you see? So, so we don't, we, we consume what we sell, you see? So, uh, and if we can't use it ourselves, we don't know how, no, don't know how to do it ourselves. Like we don't know how to sell it. So digitalization is ever evolving. Uh, and I don't think there's anyone who can actually stand up and say, oh, I'm fully ready. I'm fully digitalized now. So thank you very much. I don't need any more help. So it's an ongoing process of constant renewal and improvement. So there's always going to be something to improve on. So yeah, it's going to be a very interesting six months. The fact that uh, you speak of uh, improvements, you 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 speak of uh, what what I would paraphrase as uh, pivoting, right, from last year to this year. You yourself, as you say, you're consuming your own your own diet. Um, you know, uh, Julian, if I if I could get you to perhaps uh, give us a perspective of uh, the changes that you see, the evolution that you see, the adapt uh, the adoption of e-commerce, particularly B two B, that you see from a Southeast Asia uh, perspective, or e or even from Asia Pacific uh, from that perspective, because you know DHL. I think I think you guys are just about the only ones that are that are traveling, right? Yes, you're right, Adrian. A lot to travel under essential services. <laughs> even the even during the last full ha, we were still trying to get approval from BT online to ensure that we are also essential services. No, you're absolutely right. B two B e commerce will continue to grow exponentially in Asia, undoubtedly, right? The pandemic has sort of big time accelerated the situation. Gartner Gartner studies estimates that within the next five years. 75%, hear this, yeah, 75% of B2B procurement spending will be done online. All right, 75%. In Asia alone, Forrester is forecasting a 12% per annum growth in B2B e-commerce. And with B2B online marketplaces being the prevalent mode of businesses. So today, let me give you an example, right? We typically, DHL is a, is a sizable company. Uh, we employ close to 8,000 people in, in Malaysia. And typically, we order our pantry supplies from vendors and all that. We have just embarked on an online marketplace where, you know, each facility, we operate in like um, uh, 24 facilities and six gateways in Malaysia, right? Typically, these facilities will then go through our central procurement. I want to order uh, 10 bags of coffee, uh, 15 rims of, 15 rims of uh, A4 paper. They can now do it online via uh, a portal. So B2B e-commerce has flourished in Asia backed by the factors of government support, as you can see in, in, in Malaysia. Uh, I'm sure 
Yong will speak more about it from a SIDAC perspective. Um, rising mobile penetration, all right? The growth of B2B marketplaces as well as customers enabling transactional websites on a bread.com alone will be prevalent. In Malaysia alone, changing market dynamics and buying behavior has accelerated this need to embrace e-commerce, right? The need to redefine the supply chains and fulfillment operation is even much stronger today. B2B e-commerce have allowed buyers, many buyers, to access a larger pool of suppliers, not just your typical, uh, I mean, we've been using our, our A4 paper vendor for the last 10 years, right? But today when we open up to marketplaces, there's so many people who could participate, increasing choices and spreading the risk. So businesses today are more well-informed, right? And have support from both the government and private players to better flourish in this, in this segment. Julian, uh, having having said that, I think uh, um, the the other thing that comes up very very clear in your ultimate guide is uh, I think I think the tagline it says uh, frighteningly enough it says tradition is out digital is in the study predicts a, a strong growth uh, for the B two B e commerce market in the coming years and by twenty twenty five not even twenty twenty seven not twenty twenty five eighty percent of all B two B sales interactions between suppliers and professional buyers will take place uh, using the digital channels. So how can the B2Bs benefit from this ultimate guide? Okay, uh, good good question, Adrian. If you go through and have a chance to download the ultimate guide later, you will see there are four key benefits uh, shared in the guide. So first and foremost, I think, which is very important, and all companies, whether big, small, medium size, are looking for is increase in profit and price control. So sellers or manufacturers will get the full manu manufacturers, um, what we call as MSRP, suggested retail price, rather than the wholesale price for their products when selling through your distribution channels. All right, so you can sell direct, you, as, as what Michael Dell has always uh, taught us many, many years ago to cut down middle, middle men, right? And then that's the first, first uh, benefit, increased profit and price control. Second one would be faster time to market. Manufacturers or sellers can now get the products to market very quickly instead of contending with a lengthy traditional sales cycle, going through distribution, have a warehouse here and all that. So you can now go straight to market. So that's faster time to market. Third one would be your brand control. Manufacturers can now own their own brand. I spoke a little bit about brand.com earlier, right? This won't be diluted or misrepresented by third parties, which is typically your middlemen or distributors. Last but not least, you get to own your customer data. Data is the new, I don't know whether it's oil, no more oil. We spoke about electric cars before this, but it's a new oxygen, I guess, right? Selling directly online allows you to own those data, collect the data, and ultimately results in better product positioning, stronger relationship, and increase in sales ultimately. Yeah, so four benefits. Four benefits, and I think, uh, Julian, I agree with you. Uh, data is a new superpower, isn't it? It's a new Avenger. Correct. <laughs> Lens, uh, precisely. Lens, I'm going to ask you the question in relation to what Julian has just said. As the digitalization specialist, and that's essentially what you are, you help uh, businesses in brick and mortar become digital, right? How, yeah. do, you, how do you stack up uh, in, in this guide? And, and what do you think of the companies that are out there in Malaysia, what are they lacking? So one of the reasons why we felt this white paper resonates so well right, is that because out of the five areas that it predicted that uh, that will drive uh, the digital evolution, right, we actually cover four of them. Uh, the five areas are like digital infra, customer experience, uh, personalization, omni-channel, and synchronized logistics, right? So the first four I mentioned is actually our bread and butter. We do this every day. So because we've been a Microsoft house for the longest of time, right? So uh, digital infra is something that we do naturally uh, through our Microsoft 365 productivity tools and some Azure infrastructure as a service offerings. Uh, customer experience, uh, personalization and omni-channel are both covered by two of our products that we carry, Zendesk and HubSpot, both of which we actively advocate uh, to businesses high and low now. Uh, and I mentioned earlier that businesses started to go online selling, social media, digital marketing last year, right? This year is the year of consolidation, I feel, because how do companies do better with these new channels that they started using? Yes, you could have three or four more new staff to actually pick up the phone to answer your customers, WhatsApp, la, Facebook, la, Twitter, la, Insta, la, all you name it. La. But all of those are very disjointed. So wouldn't it be more efficient to actually be able to manage all of those in one single platform? I mean, on top of that, there's metrics to actually monitor the effectiveness data again, right? every channel, the agent serving those customers, especially if your company looking to grow that channel and not rely on information just on one person. So 
tools like 365, Zendesk allow that. Uh, Azure being the solid backbone in front that ties the whole business together. Is it? So give an example, one of our customers are actually cool, right? Um, they're actually a, lo a local company. They do batteries, car batteries on demand. So during the MCO, a lot of people got stuck at home, cannot go out, right? So their batteries died. I know mine did, so I actually called them. They actually came in about 45 minutes. So they used to run a very traditional on-site call center with a few agents managing uh, their customers. So during MCO, nobody can go to the office to actually manage the call center, right? So uh, with Zendesk, now that they are using Zendesk, they actually can go remote very seamlessly. Uh, now they can employ uh, gig workers anytime to man the contact center because it's cloud, it's cloud-based. And the agents are not actually able to accept customer calls or messages just with a flick of the on switch. So in theory, right, it actually allows Grab drivers to be contact center agents when they are sitting idle waiting for the next pickup. Uh, of course, these guys, they are, they are majority of contact center agents are actually home-based, so they, they are not Grab drivers. They are not actually picking up calls when they are driving the car. Don't worry. Um, they also grew their contact center two or three times last year and they are still growing in fact now because their business grew so big because everybody never start their engines. Everybody's batteries were <laughs> dying. So, and, 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 true, and, and their, their contact center agents, right, all they need is just a laptop and headset. So from that laptop and headset, right, at home, in the cafe, they're actually, they actually able to manage interactions with their customers either through Facebook, WhatsApp, phone calls in just that one app integrated back to their CRM as well. So you know, like if you're stranded, cannot start your car, right? You're already very flustered, right? very frustrated, right? You need to be attended quickly. So systems enable speed. They also do roadside assistance now, so they're expanding very rapidly. You know? So it's, uh, so this year will be a lot of consolidating, right? A lot uh, a lot of consolidating with uh, with regards to all the uh, variety of apps, which means essentially a variety of platforms for people to actually sell their products. Yeah. So having said that, uh, we are moving uh, towards digitalization. But uh, uh, Kai Ping, I, I didn't I didn't mean to ignore you the, the whole time, but uh, uh, let's let's bring you into the conversation. We'll take on the topic about grants slightly later. But I think uh, from what Lance has just mentioned, I think uh, uh, SIDAC focuses and SIDEX is essentially, for those of you who have just joined us, Selangor Information Technology and Digital Economy Cooperation of, of, of Malaysia. It focuses on three key sectors in the digital economy, particularly in Selangor, and it's namely e-commerce, startup, and uh, SME digitalization. With the onset of MCO uh, 3.0, which is happening right now, how are you reaching out to businesses and, and what sort of support uh, are you lending them, uh, Kai Ping? Yeah, uh, thank you, Adrian, and also uh, VLAN for inviting me. Um, yeah, SIDEC has been, uh, you know, uh, since the outbreak of uh, COVID-19, uh, we have launched two major campaigns uh, besides other, uh, other programs that we carry out at yearly. Uh, we first uh, started with, uh, you know, uh, a total of 7 million uh, uh, voucher given by Selangor government to uh, assist the uh, SME and micro SME to get on board on marketplace during the MCO time since MCO 1.0. So we have a campaign uh, working together with uh, Shopee and Lazada on uh, on since uh, e Slango e Bazaar uh, on Slango e Bazaar Raya, Slango e Bazaar November 11, and the Slango e Bazaar Chinese New Year, and also the reason concluded uh, Slango e Bazaar Raya again. So from all this, uh, you know. Uh, four major campaign actually. We have uh, recruited more than around, I think, 200,000 uh, merchants. Uh, out of them, uh, around 70,000 are the new merchants. Half of it, almost half of it, uh, new, almost uh, uh, new merchants. And then uh, out, of the five, uh, out of the 7 million voucher that actually we achieved more than, uh, you know, maybe around, um, around 100 million, uh, you know, uh, direct sales out of the voucher. So it's quite a good uh, result. And then uh, uh, if you look at the whole ripple effect, like because we, when uh, you know the uh, customer buy online, now of course our e-commerce is uh, booming. Um, so we, the ripple effect we created uh, is estimated as more than uh, two billion uh, ringgit. So so the the result is is a testimony of how uh, e-commerce has grew uh, leaps and bounds, you know. So when, when we talk about B2B with, uh, you know, Julian just now, 
and also Lance talked about consolidation. I think it's the right time. Uh, basically, if the uh, B2C is growing, obviously uh, B2B will be growing as well. You know, it brings us together because we need, uh, you know, our merchants would need uh, to source for products. Uh, B2B and also, um, you know, logistics is very crucial to be able to, to, to get it from the source. And also when you want to uh, start to do sales uh, towards the, your C segment, your your customer segment, you know, your um, your, your the, the Joe public and everybody. So obviously you need a digital system, digital tools to assist you to be able to conduct so many, you know, inquiries, um, complaints, um, you know, uh, at at hand, and also deal with uh, all sorts of uh, issues, and uh, being able to run multiple campaign as well. So also I think uh, consolidation, uh, as uh, Lance uh, mentions, I think is very crucial as well. With that, with that system uh, in play, and then uh, th that's why the final result you will see the uh, you know uh, such a uh, good achievement in terms of the uh, you know uh, onboarding and also just for the new merchants and uh, and the traditional uh, brick and mortar merchants to start to sell online. Uh, so you know. Uh, we, we have this story about, uh, uh, you know, an auntie or so somebody selling clothes and then uh, they used to sell only maybe. Yeah, they, they are now everybody almost have a shop online and also with a physical shop. But maybe the the normal sales before the MCO was just, uh, you know, uh, maybe 2000 ringgit per month. Uh, now uh, every week uh, the sales will be reached about uh, 10,000 ringgit per week. So, so you, you can see that that's the uh, the growth of tremendous growth of e-commerce, um, and then uh, I think we, because you will look at the uh, every time when there's a you know uh, there's a crisis, a pandemic happen you know, even in SARS in China 2001, that's how Alibaba grew so much, you know. So um, if you look at the, every time um, uh, you know all this pandemic actually uh, actually given the uh, silver lining is that uh, you know e-commerce and uh, digital system becoming very very crucial. It, we used to treat the uh, you know uh, our digital system is just one of the uh, computer department or something like that, but now it's, it is the essential because the whole office is down. So you have to do remote uh, working environment, your setup, and then you need to talk to your customer either to be to be uh, to be customer or to see customer. Um, so and then you need to do the business operation uh, processing. Um, you know, from uh, HR payroll until the uh, cloud accounting, invoicing and stuff like that. So I think it's all the digital system is in play. That's why we, when we talk about digitalization, it is going to be a long process. It may take, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe uh, 30 to 40 years um, from our education system up to the way we do business and how do we conduct our daily life is going to be digitalized. So Kai Ping, you're talking about changing a generation, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think may maybe not only one generation, maybe one or two generation coming. Yeah, coming. Just very quickly, in the interest of time, I just want to ask you this question, very, uh, 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 which I think is very pertinent to what we're facing. So it began as SciTech in 2015, and brick and mortar merchants, uh, you know, went to went through training programs in order to adopt e-commerce. So fast forward 2020. It was. It became very crucial suddenly. Now we are in 2021. Has this become even more important for training uh, to take place? Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, I think uh, we have gone through uh, three process. One is uh, training with uh, e-commerce and also startup, and then uh, you know, and then onboarding uh, for e-commerce as well, and also accelerate those startup. So I think the when we came to the stage three is branding, you know, and then applying the whole digital system. So our challenge now is to. I think it's rather. Uh, maybe comparatively, it's easier to you know to to pro promote e-commerce and also the uh, uh, startups. Uh, the, our challenge is to work with the uh, brick and mortar, the traditional SMEs uh, out there. You know, retail, uh, automotive industry, Malaysian light car. So that we have a huge automotive industry as well. Um, you know, and and uh, and and other like grocery products and stuff like that. How do we make our neighborhood, uh, you know, all this uh, industry in our neighborhood, SME in our neighborhood, uh, started to digitalize um, from sourcing, from let's say from B two B, and then from from buying, from delivering, uh, from logistics supply and everything, right? So they need to do that. So I think it's a challenge for us to to you know implement the. Uh, I think the 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 last hurdle is to implement the uh, digitalization in SME. 
And then you look at the uh, central government has launched this My Digital Roadmap, right? So that's a very ambitious, uh, you know, but it's very sensible and a common sense uh, the, a target that they want to, uh, uh, you know, get uh, 872,000 uh, SMEs to fully, uh, you know, on e-commerce and then increase the digitalization by 30% uh, in, in terms of the efficiency. So I, I think that that's where we are heading. Uh, Kai Ping, together with uh, Julian and Lance, I'm going to take some questions from the floor and from the audience that has just come in. Uh, Arthur has asked a question, but I think I'm going to move to the anonymous question first. It says, uh, we heard about MarTrade, or rather, let me paraphrase that, we hear about MarTrade, MyDag, Alibaba, etc. What, what are the differentiations? I'm wondering whether, uh, Kai Ping, is it a question you want to take? Yeah, I, I think, okay, it's a, it's, a, it's a function agency, okay, obviously. Um, I think it has to do with the uh, uh, DFTZ, uh, you know, uh, digital free trade zone uh, programs. I think the uh, MITI was involved, and then uh, Matrix was uh, supposed to promote the, uh, you know, MITI is a general uh, external for in charge of external trade, and then uh, Matrix is to, to promote uh, Malaysia companies to go overseas. And then, uh, you know, with Alibaba, Alibaba came into working together with the Malaysian government to set up, uh, you know, digital free trade zone. Basically, it means that you have a digital zone, uh, free trade zones that where the products will come in uh, without tax uh, in bulk. And then when they, um, you know, enter Malaysia in, into the customer of Malaysia, then they, they will be taxable or, you know, but, but the purpose is actually to uh, make Malaysia as the, uh, you know, uh, regional hub you know, for, for e-commerce and also for, you know, uh, other products that, uh, you know, uh, that can be uh, delivered through e-commerce uh, uh, processes when we talk about not only product, but also services as well. For example, uh, you know, uh, like uh, like the big, uh, 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 you know, automotive uh, brand like Petronas, like uh, Mercedes and stuff like that. Now they tend to start to, you know, work with the other, you know, other smaller dealers is all directly to a B2B platform. Um, you know, they, they have so, so many kind of products. So instead of agent uh, previously, except for their major agents, so others uh, have to procure from the uh, B2B platform as well. So you, you can see that this is how things has changed so much. And then with the backbone of, uh, you know, kind of DITZ, uh, you know, free trade zone, we will be able to, for example, you will be able to open up a six shops in Southeast Asia through, uh, for example, in mean, Shopee or Lazada. You can open up, uh, for example, let's say, uh, VLAN Vietnam, VLAN uh, Cambodia, you know, overnight. But then your your HQ is in KL, your warehouse is in KL. Um, you you just got order and then everything will shifted from, from KL. So so we need that backbone system and, uh, you know, that's why digital system and uh, also, uh, you know, like free trade zone, uh, digital free trade zone uh, is, is an important uh, crucial step towards that. Kai Ping, thank you very much. Um, for those of you who are joining uh, joining us uh, just, just right now, uh, you're currently watching Prepare for Change, the future for B2B e-commerce and how to adapt to new business norms. On the panel are DHL Express Malaysia and Brunei. SIDEG and VLAN Asia. Let's shift gears for a moment and talk about the various aspects of the digitalizing one's business, particularly in creating a better customer experience for our consumers. Lance, I'm going to go to you. What's customer experience in your words? And let's uh, let's let's be be very succinct in our answers. In the interest of time, I want to go to some of the questions that have come up. So customer experience, right? I, I'm going to interchange customer experience and CX interchangeably because it's the same thing. So CX to me, right, is actually being able to communicate with the customers in the most, uh, the, the most, ma the, the easiest manner for them to actually communicate with, the most comfortable way that they're actually uh, communicating with. Some people like WhatsApp, some people like Teams, some people like Telegram, Facebook. So being able to communicate with them on the channels that they are actually comfortable in. Uh, and also, of course, you need to have all the information that you need of the customer to make the service a bit more personalized because the customer feels more at ease when they're attended to, right? How many times that actually you felt good when you walked into a cafe and the barista actually calls you out my name? And uh, when they make your drink in the double-sized cup that nobody actually has but you. So that's personalization, you see. Uh, and don't even get me started with the phone banking. La. So how frustrating is it for you for when you call a bank, right? You get passed from department to department, explaining your problem over and over again, right? Uh, only to be sent back to the same department that you first called in. So that's terrible CX, you see. 
And how many times has Grab actually asked you to wait? A Grab driver asked you to wait, then five stars. That's customer satisfaction. It's customer satisfaction, a satisfied customer actually comes back for more, right? And they also tell people about their customer, uh, about their satisfaction, right? A dissatisfied customer actually tell people to stay away, right? So my coach actually tells me, right, uh, that it is that, uh, that statistically, right, a happy customer reciprocates positively to eight people. Whereas an unhappy customer vents to 12 people on average. So we try to keep people as happy as possible by being happy ourselves. Huh? <laughs> Thank you, Lance. Uh, Julian, our businesses, uh, in terms of its norms, is changing to accommodate B2B e-commerce. DHL, synonymous with delivery, and now e-commerce. So how does DHL feature in this arena? Because it's essentially you're a logistics company. So now you're talking about e-commerce. Okay. Thanks, Adrian. So fundamentally to me, actually the, the B2B and B2C are about the same thing, right? Selling goods to people and the expectations of these two customer groups are increasingly overlapping. But turning your B2B website into an Amazon-like experience, right, to make purchasing simpler, it's only half the story. So on a DHL front, um, we do it on a couple of pillars. One of the main pillars that we continue to drive this is what we have recently launched uh, in uh, late last year, September, October 2020, a, a focus pillar called Go Trade. The whole objective of Go Trade is to help local SMEs in Malaysia. There's close to there's slightly more than 900 over 1,000 SMEs registered in, in Malaysia. And if you look at it, only 30% of them some sort do some sort of business internationally. So Go Trade is a platform to tap on the potential of globalization in developing and emerging countries when we aim to promote sustainable growth right by helping smes to go uh, overseas and cross trade so it's made in malaysia loved by the world yeah something like that right? <laughs> and then the, we have also launched a so good under, under go trade you have um, we have also launched since 2017 to help um local smes focus on e-commerce and right on the platform we operate in 220 countries and territories Tanzania, Angola, Zimbabwe, any markets that you want to go to, right? So these outreach programs and the and the webinars that we have done since 2017 has largely targeted B2C e-commerce and SMEs who want to partake in cross-border trade. So we work with, very closely with Martrade, we work very closely with all those agencies that, that Yong has spoken earlier. So we have, in, in since inception, we have engaged close to 6,000 SMEs uh, to, take, to assist them in their e-commerce and export activities. And then establishing a whole ecosystem from uh, en enablers like payment gateway, business financing, packaging solution, digital agencies, photography and other requirements that is required digitally to cross to do cross-border trading All right so on in onboarding um, we, I've got many examples to share we have seen 450 SMEs since 2018 right that ventures into platforms like such as Shopify that that has been very successful I think one of the examples quoted earlier by, by Yong is if you don't if you don't have an online channel today I think you'll be even suffering more during this pandemic Correct. Uh, Lance, just very quickly, based on uh, Julian's uh, response to them, he talks about he talks about onboarding and and this uh, and this uh, you know go trade. Um, how does Ulan Asia Solutions fit into all this? Very quickly. So uh, while we currently don't have any direct integrations with any logistics systems at this point in time, right? But that will change in the near future with our partnership with DHL now. Uh, it is possible to actually integrate ordering systems to warehouse management systems to manage logistics and goods and services. Uh. so. Um, Systems that we carry primarily have open APIs that allow connectivity between platforms uh, and systems can actually do integrations quite simply. Um, uh, but let's say, for example, a purchase order to a specific vendor placed in Zero, the cloud accounting system that we carry, right, uh, can immediately initiate a pickup request to another open API system. Uh, likewise, an invoice or delivery note can trigger a warehouse system to do the pick and pack stuff uh, uh, for, so that the order item can be picked up and delivered to the customer, whether it's B2B or B2C. You see. So since all our systems are on public cloud anyway and have got open APIs, integrations galore, uh, we can interconnect with almost anybody willing to accept us. Okay. Julian, what's obvious with uh, DHL is that you happen to own your own planes. I'm going on the next holiday with you, I've decided. Uh, <laughs> does this factor eliminate your competition? And if it doesn't, how does DHL stack up and compete with the other logistics players in the market and uh, make for perhaps better CX, customer experience? Uh, first and foremost, the jump seat in a cargo plane won't be very comfortable. So <laughs> I think the closest you probably laugh is Singapore. <laughs> All right, so during this... <laughs> 
<laughs> so during this pandemic, right, um, obviously the, the, the number of planes that we own gave, gave us an advantage, right, due to the many grounding of um, uh, passenger aircrafts. So we own about 280 planes. Thank God, thank God we bought extra, we ordered extra planes uh, towards uh, 2018, right, and we ordered close to about 17 extra 777s. It was initially to give us uh, the advantage of refleeting our old planes, the old 747s, which are not as green. The new 777s are, are, are much greener, longer range, right? But in my opinion, I guess many competitors or many uh, different carriers can also own similar fleet of aircrafts, hubs, and service centers, right? Which is probably the basic of what you need to be able to, to operate as an international express express uh, provider. So for me, I think the key differentiator would be truly our people. So our people continues to be the key pillar of investment. Um, many a times it when 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 during a downturn, right? First thing you cut is 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 training. First thing you cut is recruitment. First thing you cut is uh, T and E, travel and entertainment and all that. But we know we we continue to invest in an area because we believe our culture uh, of having the right people, that means a higher right and nurture well, is extremely important to make sure that we create treat. Treat your people well, and they will treat your customers well. I think that's what we believe. So the focus strategy for DHL since the last uh, what 12, 13 years has always been having a group of motivated people because we believe that if your people are motivated, they are engaged, they're well trained, they're well equipped, they will make sure that the customers are kept happy. Customers uh, they will give a great service quality, and the customers will stay loyal, and in return will give you the profit and the top line that you're looking for. Okay, uh, Julian, thank you for that. I I, I agree with you. Hire well, huh? Um, and and the other thing is, the the other thing I, I perhaps want to go to is uh, some of the questions that have come up. Uh, anonymous, uh, you've asked. I'm going to combine both your questions. I'm working in an SME company. How can I fit into this new change? And it says, how can we grow our business in this new norm? Because it leads me to really the question I'm going to ask uh, uh, Kai Ping, which is for companies that are only now, only now looking into embracing e-commerce as part of their traditional B2B trading. Where and how do they start? Can can you give me some success? stories are uh, kiping with uh, organizations have started just in 2021 maybe just after chinese new year and 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 how have they uh, profit from going into the e-commerce platform yeah uh thank you uh, for for the questions i think uh, basically you're looking at when you want to start right i think there are two two processes you're looking at one is the to 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 you know have a present a social uh or online present, either social media or, or website. And then, of course, you need to go to maybe for going for a marketplace, uh, you know, B2B marketplace or on your own website as well, and then uh, get to the customers. So I think that that's uh, the, you know, the, the, the common sense side, right? And then, uh, for example, if you are B2B uh, industry, right? So I think then you, you can look for whether you are, for example, if you are in FMB, so maybe you look at the, some of the uh, popular marketplace uh, for B two B in uh, you know in, in Malaysia, for example, uh, Dropi, La Pasa, and uh, th these are some of the places. And then all, and then of course you can work together with uh, when you establish your you know B two B suppliers. Then you need uh, logistic support. Of course you can work with uh, DHL. And then uh, then when you need the more you know um, digital marketing, uh, you know. Uh, process and stuff like that, and then of course you you can engage to some of the uh, you know digital service provider uh, to to work with them. So I think I think that that's the the, the whole process to transform your businesses uh, to digitalize, and uh, you know so that you will be able to run your businesses uh, 24/7 even while you were sleeping. Your your chat bot will be able to accept uh, inquiries, um, you know answers questions, uh, even orders. Or even down to doing payment, so um, the, the so the invoicing and everything you will be able to do it send out uh, every any place anytime, you know. So not only increase efficiency, but also uh, you know uh, reduce your your cost, and then but you reach up to more customer. For example, um, you might you might be able to um, you reach out to customer in other Southeast Asia. Uh, uh, the easiest way is to source open your product. Uh, maybe from uh, China, from Middle East, uh, through the halal market, uh, uh, Middle East, the Mena country, uh, uh, um, Middle East and also Northern Africa and stuff like that. So all this, uh, you know, for example, during Hari Raya dates are very popular. So you can source this product from, uh, you know, from the halal uh, B2B uh, platform and then 
start to sell it, sell East Asia. Um, you know, um, Chinese New Year, then you get products from uh, China, and then you you send, uh, you sell it in, to the uh, B two B client in, in in Southeast Asia. So, so so that is how you you can work out that that businesses. So I think uh, a lot of them uh, B two B businesses are very much focused on uh, retail, uh, on um, you know chain shop retail, uh, you know, uh, clo clothing as well. Yeah. Can I chime in here? Sure. Gentlemen, uh, gentlemen, with, uh, I'm just doing a time check, uh, 20 minutes. Uh, Lance, I will get to you in a moment. But I think uh, this is a question, Lance, that I, I think you can answer together with uh, Julian and uh, and Yong uh, and, and, uh, and Kai Ping as well. Arthur has asked a question that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, he says in, 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 the, in the question in a Q&A box, I've been hearing about businesses going into the digital channel because of this new normal. So as a result, less manpower is needed. More people are losing their jobs and there is a reduce in terms of of our take home pay. So how does this affect the way how employers recruit and what type of job scope is still relevant in this new normal? Considering that uh, I think Julian knew uh, DHL has got 8,000 employees in Malaysia. I'm wondering whether you want to take that just very quickly. Sure. Okay. Thanks, Adrian. No, I was just two days ago recently posted on my LinkedIn that I'm hiring, right? So, <laughs> so I, I, I guess um, to, to Arthur's question, the, the traditional jobs and roles, for example, um, pickup and delivery drivers, um, warehouse executive, operations executive, customer service advisors, we still need them because we're not shutting down the call center, right? To what Lance has mentioned earlier, we have a 24 by 7 call center. Uh, obviously, 150 of them are all working from home today. We, we we sort of transformed them into a mobile customer service centers just within two weeks. Not easy with all the technology that Lance mentioned. If we don't have that, we have, if we have not invested on that, we wouldn't be able to do that, right? So those traditional roles will still be there. And for co companies and for industries that are doing well during this pandemic, I think you will continue to hire, you continue to train people in that role. What, has, what we have seen evolve are new roles. Um, it, those that we have mentioned earlier, data related, e-commerce related, marketplaces related. We're just on a call before this call, right? To look at how we could do social listening. We collect many customer feedback from uh, surveys, from whether it's email or online or through, through phone, right? But today, do we listen to our customers on what they say on Facebook, what they say on Twitter, what they say on Instagram? So that's our areas where we have um, invested in since uh, just right before the pandemic to make sure that we are able to, in my blueprint today, right? If you, if you look at the DHL blueprint that, that these roles are not available. And when I go to my boss and say, okay, I want to hire this, I want to hire that, he say, yeah, but it's not in your blueprint. What do you do? So what you do is you write on a management training program, you write on an internship program, do it locally and make sure you hire those people with skills. And it, obviously the company as, or maybe not old, but not as agile, uh, will take some time to renew the blueprint and when the time is right, you already have these talents trained in, 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 for you to, to, to hire. Thank you for that, uh, Julian. Lance, uh, just very quickly, Domino's Pizza, uh, Magnum 4D, Rockwells, uh, AirGuard, some of your clients who have digitalized portions of their business. I'm, I'm very keen to know how they have uh, improved in terms of their, of their business strategies and also their sales targets and what can others learn from them? Because one of the questions that has come up in, uh, from Anonymous is, is uh, he says, is startup or micro SME suitable to go into the B2B e-commerce platform where there is Resources are so limited. So, in comparison to perhaps Magnum 40 and Rock Wheels and Airguard, these are larger organizations. So, he says that he's uh, from a micro SME. What's the difference? Compare contrast for us, please. So, uh, if you ask me whether or not you're a large company or a small company, right, systems like this actually don't cost a lot of money because there's very little infrastructure cost, there's very little uh, capital expenditures. It's all on a subscription basis. So, actually, it's very affordable for even small companies to actually come on board. The majority of our customers are actually SMEs and micro SMEs. Uh, we only have a handful of uh, what we call SMC, small medium corporates who are actually on our platforms. So just now you mentioned the three companies, uh, three, uh, three or four customers, Domino's, Magnum, what was, it's quite straightforward. They actually use Zendesk to actually manage their customer service, uh, both internal and external. I mean, have you ever wondered what happens if let's say your pizza never ordered, right? If you're who you call, naturally you will actually call the same number you ordered the pizza, right? Yeah. But if you think about it, right, that's actually an ordering system. What you need is customer service, right? So the ordering system call agent I won't, won't be even trained to actually ha handle a, a, a hangry, <laughs> irate customer waiting for his pizza, right? So we have to help them set up the customer service uh, 
uh, help desk for them. Uh, and uh, let's say, uh, then for Magnum, we actually help them set up uh, their internal service structure, support substructure for the service team to actually manage their outlets nationally, the whole nation. So all their service teams actually use uh, Zendesk to actually manage their, their services. Uh. So for AirGuard, right, just like you mentioned, guarding AirGuard, uh, they actually sell all sorts of uh, ventilation stuff. Uh, so those, you know, huge, high volume, low speed HVLS fans you see in big areas like malls, right? Uh, they sell those stuff. Uh, they also sell stuff like hygiene products, like consumer fans. Like. So uh, nowadays, contactless soap dispensers are actually the thin thing uh, because you don't want to be touching all these soap dispensers in the toilet. You see? So I always, tell, I always tell, say like, these guys actually deal with air. <laughs> with COVID now, uh, ventilation is very important. Right? So these guys, uh, they went for the jugular. The owner, right, uh, Mr. T, is right, a bit more gung-ho. Like. So he had the foresight to realize that traditional waste must go in order to grow. So uh, he they implemented quite a lot of things. Uh, we helped them. Uh, we actually helped them uh, apply for the MDEC grant as well. They successfully got it. Uh, and now I believe they're beginning to see some results from last year's work. Uh, they're in a better position to tackle online requests. They can uh, manage their digital presence a bit better uh, because they don't have to outsource this, which costs them a lot more money. Uh, then they can also monitor their sales very easily now uh, because they have uh, you know, they have a centralized CRM. So one of the things they've never done in the past was to actually look at existing data to actually grow revenue from the existing customer base. Uh, having systems let them analyze this data, curate more specific targeted campaigns to monitor to monetize uh, this uh, segment of existing customers they've never approached before for uh, with other products. Lens, we've got our uh, and and uh, what you, Julian and Kai Ping uh, with ten minutes into into uh, the conversation ending. I want to move very quickly into digitalization grants, uh, which is something that is uh, that is in the portfolio of SIDEC. So Kai Ping, I'm going to ask you the question: the onset of pandemic in March of 2020, and now we're in 2021, and uh, the shock. Uh, this is delivered to small and uh, micro businesses now depending on face-to-face -face, uh, transactions. It's also triggered uh, the state government to accelerate its e-commerce drive initiatives, right? So tell us a little bit more about this uh, 5,000 ringgit matching grant that is currently being rolled out by SIDAC. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, the uh, Selangor SME digitalization uh, matching grant is basically uh, where the Selangor state government will provide a 50% matching grant or maximum of 5,000 for each company to subscribe to a digital service uh, provider. So the matching grant is, the total of the matching grant is 5 million. We expect to benefit a thousand slang SMEs. Um, so the five basic uh, digitalization areas offered are e-commerce, HR and payroll system, cloud accounting, digital marketing, and then uh, electronic point of sales, uh, ecosystem and payment gateway as well. So uh, for example, like uh, logistic uh, is, is considered under e-commerce and, you know, and, and others are, uh, yeah, see, CRM and, and, and the rest is, is part and parcel of uh, you can be, um, you know, uh, cloud counting as well, you know. So so that that's where we are. And then uh, we have opened the process of uh, application. Um, it started in April, extended to, uh, you know, June 15. So you can still apply uh, June 15. Uh, that's uh, ended for the first batch. Well, we will open up again for the second batch in uh, August because some of the company may not be ready with the uh, documentation and the uh, application process. But we have simplified the application process and the eligible, uh, eligibility uh, criteria uh, is basically a 51% uh, uh, company owns uh, by Malaysian uh, and then uh, it must be registered in Slango or have a business address in Slango. So uh, in operation for at least a year and uh, Minimum uh, annual sales uh, turnover of three hundred thousand, but not exceeding uh, one million. Uh, and 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 they just need to produce uh, audited financial statement for last financial years, or the latest management account or evidence of sales turnover. Because our purposes is to be inclusive. Uh, we don't want to bog down, uh, but obviously there's there's some uh, documentation. And as soon as they sub, um, they they look at the you know they they can go, come to their CDEC website. To look for the areas of services they needed and then also uh, and then take a look at the uh, digital service provider and uh, we have more than 100 uh, in our website talk to them and get the quotation and then uh, submit the uh, um, you know submit the uh, the documentation to us and then uh, when approved and then uh, they will start to do the activation and after activation of 21 days um, you just send us a proof of activation and then we will release a grant 
we started to release a grant for um, you know almost a hundred applicants already. Yeah. Okay. What are the what are the denominators that drive Sidex the direction or objectives, and how does the grant uh, archiving feature in your aim to assist businesses? I think, as I said to, uh, before, that I think the 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 you know the the, the purpose of digitalization is the, just like uh, Lance uh, described previously, uh, is to able to use data to analyze your business. Uh, to, to build that infrastructure, to do the system, um, the data that you own or, or you know, uh, to, to, to discover the new market or monetize the, uh, you know, for, from your old customer as well. But of course, uh, when we previously we talk about, uh, you know, customer experience as well, uh, you look at the funnel theory, you get uh, through publicity, uh, digital marketing to get your customer coming in and then uh, make sure they will be able to do the conversion because the conversion is the most difficult, difficult part. And then, uh, you know, become your ambassador, um, you know, retain the customer to buy a game, become your ambassador. So that's why crucial because you look at 2080 uh, theory, that actually every time what you need to do is to retain the 80% of your customers. And then of course, when you do that on your front end, at the back end is of course B2B business, um, where you have uh, to do sourcing, uh, you make sure your logistic uh, you know, uh, is uh, on time, uh, not only came to the product that you, you procure came to your um, hub, but also deliver to the customer as well. And then uh, you know, uh, and then uh, customer satisfaction uh, responses and stuff like that. So, so the whole process uh, we are looking at that. Uh, so, no need digital presence where we are very high in terms of globally. We have like eighty to ninety percent of digital presence, social media and stuff like that. But only fifty percent of our company has used uh, cloud uh, accounting. So, and you look at HR payroll and the rest is less than twenty percent. Uh, you can find that a lot of uh, big businesses, uh, restaurant and stuff like that, still use Excel, uh, uh, you know, day to day, uh, you know, and uh, the maximum, uh, you know, uh, tools that use is EPO system. So because now um, it's locked down, so they have to do delivery line. So EPO system is very crucial for them. So I, I think uh, we, we need uh, to encourage, uh, you know, our SMEs to fully digitalize. Because if you look at the uh, Northern Asia, uh, from Hong Kong uh, onwards, 95% of them is on cloud, but maybe less than 5% of Southeast Asia companies on cloud. You know, um, um, I think one of the major reasons is that uh, Northern Asia, the business is so competitive, so everybody has to be on the you know best tools. While in Southeast Asia, we, we used to be quite relaxed, you know, uh, it was quite comfortable, but because of uh, you know uh, pandemic. Now everyone has to upgrade, uh, up, uh, you know, improve your games, um, you know. So and then uh, we are moving towards a fully, um, you know, integrated uh, regional market now, um, you know, with all sorts of trade agreement. We are signing up with a digitalized uh, market, um, you know, and the e e easier way to do business uh, across the uh, region. So I think uh, digitalization is the way to go. Uh, and then it won't be. We, we I, mean, I think it's not going to to be a new norm. We, it, it's going to be a new normal, you know. It's like like uh, or or you say that uh, we won't go back to the pre-COVID uh, kind of situation. So those who have not been able to digitalize, you will find very challenging. But if you start to do that process, uh, you know, because out the uh, when the pandemic ends, obviously, you know. Uh, there will be rejuvenation. They will be bounce. Uh, economy will bounce back. And you know, if you look at the uh, US and uh, UK now, everybody is going out. You know, uh, on on a basketball game and everything has has been crazy because of uh, lockdown a year in home. And yeah, they're allowed to hug and they're allowed to shake hands as well, Kaiping. Yeah, so that's yeah, what's yeah, happening yeah. in the UK and the US. I want yeah. to quick go into some of the questions that are coming in from the floor. Um, Lance, I'm hoping you can take this one. What are the solutions for SMEs to market their products globally? Uh, we've got five minutes before we end, so just a very quick answer. So uh, some products like HubSpot like we carry, like Zendesk we carry, most of the tools I mentioned just now and the systems I mentioned just now actually qualify for the CNET gun as well. So. Uh, if let's say you're a business that actually need to improve your office productivity or manage your brand or customer experience, whether you want to go local or global, uh, most of this meet the criteria. As long as you, you meet the criteria of the grant, you can, and can apply for it. Uh, and we will handhold you through the entire process. Okay, uh, very quickly, the, the current 
uh, COVID-19 or pandemic landscape, right? Uh, what are the other challenges for a B2B SMEs who are now moving into the e-commerce platform? I'm going to move that question to perhaps Julian. Okay, Adrian, thanks. I think to me it's two things. Um, as you've heard from Lance, you've heard from Yong, there, there are both a lot of help and support given by the government, private sectors, and all the experts, banks included. So there's no lack of information, no lack of support, right? To me, it's actually mindset and guts to move. So if you don't have the mindset to change, you want to stay where you are, all the best. <laughs> and you need to have the guts to make this move, right? So either, I mean, even a company as big as DHL, we are the 11 largest employer in the world. We are using this opportunity during the pandemic to change the whole landscape of customer experience, to make sure that we are omni-channel, to make sure that we, are, we have the right digital infrastructure, to make sure that, like what Len said, personalized customer experience, seamless integration. A company as big as us, we're taking this, this it's very painful, right? 600,000 employees uh, across the world telling people about digitalization. It takes about two years to get to the last person on the ground to, to explain to them what digitalization is all about. For SMEs, you guys are a bit more agile, more lean. You should do this soon as possible. I think to me is really mindset and guts. Let me chime in for that as well. Uh, Adrian. Mindset and guts. Uh, Sorry, Lance, go I, ahead. Can I chime in for that, uh, Adrian? Just yeah. very quickly. Uh, the biggest problem now is getting started. It can be very daunting and potentially very expensive also, especially for the not so tech savvy. So that's where we come in, you see. So we, we actually understand the business before we tailor a solution to actually help the business go, go digital. It's no point buying a system that doesn't work and shove it down the throat of a business that doesn't, won't use it, right? I mean, we've all seen white elephant systems before. Only 10% is used, but then it just sits there and it costs a bomb, right? And our services don't cost 70 million bucks. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Lance, I, I think, uh, you talk a lot I, about, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Kaiping, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, if I can add, uh, you know, uh, don't go alone uh, doing digitalization. Talk to people, uh, talk yeah. to your peer in the industry, uh, talk to expert, you know, uh, like uh, Lance and, you know, and uh, Julian, talk to everybody, those who can uh, have experience done it. Yes, and then uh, get as many uh, help as well, we've got two minutes to end. Um, Lance, uh, there is a question that is, that is actually uh, industry specific because we're talking about a lot of companies that have uh, that have products, right? So the question is, what do you think are some of the tech, uh, technology changes that training companies uh, should develop in the new normal? Well, for, for starters, you need to be able to reach out to your customers, right? You need to be able to find new customers, right? Uh, traditional ways of marketing, traditional ways of actually approaching companies to actually sign up for your for training uh, programs is down the drain. You can't do face to face anymore. So you need to know how to actually engage them online. You need to be able to know how to educate people without them actually having to speak to a salesperson first. So systems actually enable you to actually reach out to potential prospects before you actually sign them up on your training course. Very simple. Thank you, Lance. Um, two minutes in uh, before before we call it, uh, we call it a, 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 a good afternoon, I guess. Um, our future is unpredictable right now, gentlemen, and um, businesses in numerous factor, in numerous sectors, they are all affected. Uh, we really do not know what the economic outlook is going to be like uh, in this uh, catastrophe. I call it a catastrophe. So, so now in this COVID climate, how are you, the three of you, in from from a perspective of your business, how are you navigating your respective business in the coming three months, uh, and then maybe the rest of the year? Let's start with Julian. So for us, very simple, three things. Make sure that we continue to invest in our people, keep them safe, keep them sound so that they can provide the best level of service to, to our customers. Third, secondly, is to make sure our customers continue to be successful. As you know, border closures, lack of air freight capacity and all that stuff, we've got to make sure that we continue to invest in our business, especially digital infrastructure. Make sure that we continue to keep the best level of service. And thirdly, to make sure that we constantly look at changing our business continuity plan, like what Yong said, right? The new normal will be totally different and it's hard to go back to pre-COVID days. Thank you. The new normal is going to be the normal, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Sidek, what's uh, what's your view, uh, Kaiping? I think we are looking towards the uh, post-COVID uh, situation because I think uh, hopefully things will change uh, in, uh, a lot when you know when our vaccination process done uh, in uh, this year. So um, if we look at the some of the countries uh, like China, US, uh, the business are thriving, and then uh, but the the main uh, condition is that. 
you must the precondition is that you must be able to digitalize your business. So for us, is we are promoting this uh, digitalization grant so that as as, as many as uh, you know SME can apply. And, and then if the uh, digital grant is, uh, you know, received warmly uh, enthusiastic uh, response, so maybe the, uh, you know, the, the government would be able to justify to, to, to launch a uh, bigger, you know, uh, grant support as well. So with the, uh, so the, the SME has to give us a support uh, towards the uh, digitalization grant and then also work together with our experts, um, you know, like uh, DHL, like VLAN, you know, so that to, to grow their business, then uh, then then we will be able to to have this uh, digitalization agenda implement and then more support uh, you know from the businesses from the government as well. Yeah. Lance, last words. How are you navigating your business in the next three months and then for the rest of the year? So June is actually our final final month for our financial year. So we're trying to go all out to end with a bang up. But of course, the MCO put a bit of a dampener, slowed things down a bit. Uh, but we're still cautiously, cautiously optimistic we'll pull through. Uh, beyond June, well, hopefully I hope we got enough people vaccinated so I can get you guys out, Adrian, Julian, typing out for coffee so I can thank you guys in person uh, to actually, for actually coming for our little chat today. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Lance, just so you know, if I call for pizza and it doesn't come to my house, I'm going to be calling you. <laughs> On that answer, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude our live webinar, Prepare for Change, the Future of B2B E-Commerce and How to Adapt to New Business Norms. Uh, we say thank you to uh, the Managing Director of DHL Express Malaysia in Brunei, Mr. Julian Neal. Thank you very much, Julian. The CEO of Slango Information Technology and Digital Economy Cooperation or SIDAC, Mr. Yong Kai Ping, and Lance Chiang, the Managing Director of VLAN Asia. To our participants, uh, thank you very much for joining us online today. Norman Lim of VLAN Asia, it's back to you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who have, I uh, hope this session has actually given you an insight on digitalization. If you would like to actually start your journey, you can actually scan this QR code, which is displayed on the screen, and we can actually help you to get a, a grant, which is worth 5,000 ringgit from CDEC. And also, like I mentioned earlier on before the start of the event, uh, if you could just kindly scan this QR code and give us your attendance, we would like to actually give you a gift for your kind attendance today. Well, uh, that's all for today. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you to the panel. Thank you, Adrian, uh, our moderator. We will catch you soon for the next webinar. You have a, everybody have a nice day. Bye. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. See you.